get to your seat. I'm just kidding. <laughs> Welcome back. Um, I'm Daphina McMillan. I'm the Director of Communications and Conferences here at TCG. Um, thank you. Uh, it's been such a joy over these past few days um, meeting with old conference friends and making new ones. Uh, we work all year to put this conference together and then it's over in just a few days. <laughs> But what happens here inspires us to keep going all year long, truly. And that's because of the generosity of spirit that so many of you bring. We know how incredibly busy you are, but the fact that so many of you clear your schedules, make the trek so that you can ask questions together, share knowledge together, dream to the mountaintop together, and take the risks together in order to move towards a better world means more than you know. So before we jump into the thick of things, I just simply want to say thank you. Thank you for being here. I also want to send a special thanks uh, to the Actors Fund for sponsoring that last coffee break. We all needed it. Um, they've left some flyers out uh, about the wonderful programs and services they offer. Uh, check by the registration table. So with that, let's jump in. Please join me in welcoming to the stage Steve Scott, producer and artistic associate at the Goodman Theater, who's going to present the Visionary Leadership Award. I first met Rock Shelfer on my 30th birthday when I came to the Goodman Theater to interview for the job of Director of Educational Programs. Uh, now, I had moved to Chicago literally days before from the wilds of central Kansas. <laughs> yeah, insert your own joke here. And I knew of the Goodman as a venerated, decades-old institution. So I was pretty sure that the executive director of the Goodman, which I think was then called the producing director, had to be someone as venerated as the theater itself, uh, a John Houseman type perhaps, uh, sitting in a paneled office, smoking a pipe, reminiscing about his days with Geraldine Page and Morris Karnofsky. Uh, you can imagine my surprise then when I, would when I was ushered into the office of a guy who appeared to have come just from his high school prom, <laughs> or at least from uh, fraternity pledge week. As we began to speak about the job, I kept waiting for a door to open through which the real producing director would emerge, since this guy was obviously his assistant, or his intern, or maybe his nephew. Uh, we talked, and eventually I heard him offer me the job. Of course, I eagerly accepted, but as I left his office and walked up the long staircase that uh, was in the lobby of the old Goodman Theater, I began to wonder, is he actually running this place? Well, it's 34 years later now, I look like this, and Rock looks, uh, well, due to a fortuitous gene pool and a portrait hidden in somebody's attic, <laughs> pretty much the same. But I learned a long time ago that his youthful, youthful countenance was, and still is, uh, rather deceptive. Uh, by the time of our fateful first meeting, Rock had already been working at the Goodman for six years working his way up, Horatio Alger style, from the box office to the assistant to the producing director, to the producing director of Goodman's experimental series, Stage 2, to the top job itself. As the producer of Stage 2, he had already brought to the stage, among many other things, a little play called American Buffalo, which quickly took uh, Chicago's audiences and critics by storm and, of course, launched the national career of David Mamet. Uh, his work with Stage 2 also brought wider exposure to such rising talents as Frank Galati, John Malkovich, Michael Maggio, and Robert Falls. Rock had uh, been one of the founders of what would become the League of Chicago Theaters, the organization that brought the ever-increasing number of local companies together into what would soon be recognized as the most dynamic theater company and community in the country. He had helped to guide the Goodman Theater through the often fraught transformation from a Department of the Art Institute of Chicago to an independent cultural institution. And he had helped bring to the Goodman main stage such projects as A Christmas Carol, which in retrospect may seem to be a no-brainer, but at the time was a massively risky and costly undertaking with no guarantee of success. 
Now, today, of course, that decision has become our city's most beloved holiday tradition, and it has brought literally millions of audiences through the doors of the Goodman Theater, introducing generations of young audiences to the power of live theater. Now, since then, Rock's career has become something of an American theater legend. There is no one in this room who has not benefited from his tireless advocacy efforts during the past four decades, with his leadership of such organizations as the Performing Arts Alliance, the League of Resident Theaters, the American Arts Alliance, and of course, TCG. And you can read his bio yourself for those details. At the Goodman, he has overseen well over 300 productions, including nearly 130 world premieres, works including American Buffalo, and A Life in the Theater, and Marvin's Room, and Ruined, and many, many others. When the old Goodman space of the Art Institute proved to be too antiquated for the kinds of productions that we wanted to do, Rock spent nearly two decades researching, planning, cajoling, wheedling, and fundraising until in the fall of 2000, the Goodman's new state-of-the-art home was a reality. In the often fractionalized and segregated Chicago community, Rock was an early and passionate advocate for diversity and inclusion on stage and off, well before these ideas were adapted by lo other local cultural leaders, and his belief that the theater should not only reflect the community in which it works, but should also affect changes in that community, has resulted in an unparalleled series of engagement programs for students, teachers, senior citizens, and many, many other special constituencies. And the artistic successes that Rock has overseen are legion, reflected by dozens of local and national awards, a 90% average attendance level, and a five-fold increase in ticket, sales, in, uh, in ticket sales revenue during his tenure. But these statistics, as impressive as they are, don't really capture the essence of Rock as a leader or as a man. He can be a demanding and exacting boss, but he takes equal delight in empowering his staff to do what they do best and is unstinting in his praise and support. As many of you know, he can be a tenacious negotiator, but never at the expense of what is fair or just for the artists whose work is the reason for our existence. He does not suffer fools gladly, but never rejects out of hand any idea, knowing that some of the most seemingly outrageous suggestions may lead to the most exciting projects. Although he has spent more than half of his life at the helm of the Goodman Theater, he approaches each new project, each seemingly insurmountable challenge, with the enthusiasm and optimism and energy of someone just starting his career. And for those of, of, of us and you who are just starting, he is boundlessly generous. I doubt that there is a theater or a theater leader in our Chicago community who hasn't come to Rock for advice advice which he gladly and patiently gives. And remember, there are over 200 theaters in our community. It is a community and an art form that he loves and supports with every fiber of his being, through his mentorship, through his attendance at theaters large and small, and through his own personal contributions. Rock also like, loves a lot of other things. The Chicago White Sox, his wife Mary Beth, his family, the garden at his house in Michigan, and golf. He is absolutely the best gift giver ever. Knowing my propensity for trashy movie star biographies, he delights in giving me every year for my birthday a whole stack of the best and the trashiest. And due to rock, I am now the proud owner of two editions of the autobiography of Ricky Martin. <laughs> in both English and Spanish editions. He is a gracious and often hilarious host at Goodman staff parties, which are frequent and lavish. And he loves and cherishes the people with whom he works, celebrating the successes, both personal and professional, offering consolation and much needed emotional support at times of tragedy and hardship. There are things that Rock hates, too. Liars, whiners, exploiters, those who pretend to be what they're not, or who attempt to victimize others. In my 34 years of working with him, I've learned that you can put absolutely nothing over on him, and if you screw up, you better be able to explain why. 
I've also learned that there is no one who better has my back or who, who will stand up for me or will sing my praises and those of my colleagues more heartily and more fervently. This season is Rock's 40th at the Goodman, an anniversary that we've been celebrating all year. Uh, Rock says that he's sick of all the hoopla. I kind of doubt that, but anyway. <laughs> at this venerated stage of his life and career, he's often referred to as the godfather of Chicago theater. That may be an overstatement, but actually I don't think it is. Like hundreds, maybe thousands of other theater artists and managers, I owe my life and my career to Rock Shelfer. And many, of, and many millions of theater audiences in Chicago, in New York, and in other cities across the country and around the world owe the hours that they've spent being entertained and delighted and at so sometimes provoked and enraged by our work to his remarkable leadership, tenacity, and humanity. Rock has often said that he's done all of this simply because he loves the theater, what it can do and say, and the difference that it can make in all of our lives. It is that love that we honor today. And it is my great honor to be able to present Rock Edward Schulfer with his very much deserved Visionary Leadership Award. Rock. Goodness, um, it's very hard to go on after that introduction. Thank you, Steve. I have your back and you have my back and I'm very grateful for that. I would like to thank TCG for the chance to open for Taylor Mack and Craig Lucas. <laughs> I know that it will do wonders for my career. I can't wait till my agent hears about it. Uh, I'm the only thing standing between you and Taylor Mack. So, <laughs> thank you. Thank you to TCG for this honor. Uh, it is especially humbling because there are many of my colleagues who deserve this recognition. Uh, my professional partner, Robert Falls, the Goodman Artistic Collective, thousands of artists and staff and trustees and patrons have made my life in the theater possible. It's, a one, it's wonderful to be able to publicly express my gratitude to them for all that they have done. And most of all, I want to thank my wife, Mary Beth Fisher, for her extraordinary love, support, and her artistry. For around 30 years, we've worked at the Goodman to create a large theater institution that is based on the values of supporting artists and theater professionals, aesthetic and cultural diversity, inclusion, and an intrinsic engagement with our community. This includes, as Steve talked about, being very involved with many individuals and organizations in the arts and elsewhere in our society, uh, like TCG, LORT. Um, I am the only person who's worked with every TCG executive director, actually, so I can tell you all the stories that you'd like to know. Um, and anyway, in uh, the Performing Arts Alliance, as was mentioned, um, and many others, Goodman Theater, like the American theater, is not perfect and never will be perfect. All of the ways that it's not perfect are what keep me up at night. Although actually thinking about it, uh, that question was asked in one of the breakout sections as kind of a conversation starter. And it occurred to me, um, you know, it really should be not what keeps you awake at night, but what keeps you awake during the day? Because during the day, <laughs> you have a chance to do something about it. <laughs> it's kind of like, uh, you know, wanting to, to support uh, the right to fail, which I've never understood either. I mean, who wants the right to fail? Nobody wants to fail. Everybody, all we want is the opportunity to succeed. That's, anyway, that's, uh, I, I digress. Um, 
So despite the fact that we're not perfect, I, I am optimistic about the future of the American theater and the Goodman because the Goodman has been transformed by the work of many, many, many people into a community institution that is permanently committed to the values that I talked about before. Uh, and it will be committed to those values long after Bob Falls and I have ridden off into the sunset, not that we plan to go anywhere yet. Um, it can be done. Transformation can take place. Finally, I, I believe it's important to remember that the idea of professional theater as an art form in our country is really relatively new. Uh, as a movement, it began with a small group of artists who wanted to produce theater that was very different from the world of Broadway. In only 50 some years, we have seen incredible growth in the quality, range, reach, and development of the not-for-profit theater. I mean, the change from when I started, it, no one could have imagined it. No one could have imagined the change then. I'm grateful to have had the opportunity to participate in that evolution, and it fills me with a tremendous sense of responsibility. So in closing, my, my hope for all of us in the American theater is that we continue to recognize that whatever our differences appear to be and whatever tensions exist, all of us in the theater have far more in common than we sometimes think or admit. I believe that together our artists and theaters will continue to move to the forefront in illuminating the changes that have and will take place in our society and our world. It is challenging, it is not easy, but it is very exciting and I can't wait to see what happens. Thank you. Thank you, Rock, for those beautiful remarks and truly all you've done for our field. Thank you. And now, <laughs> I'm very excited to welcome two amazing theater artists to the stage. Craig Lucas is an OB award-winning director and a Pulitzer Prize finalist playwright who has authored such beloved works as Prelude to a Kiss, Blue Window, and The Book for the Light in the Piazza. Taylor Mack was called one of the most exciting theater artists of our time, the best theater actor of 2013 by the Village Voice, and the New York Times wrote of Mac, fabulousness can come in many forms, and Taylor Mac seems intent on assuming, assuming every one of them. Please join me in welcoming Craig Lucas and Taylor Mac. <laughs> Hello! <laughs> Taylor Matt is. Is this working? Did you turn it on? I did turn it on. <laughs> on. 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 Is it on now? I don't know what to do. There we go. <laughs> Taylor Mack is a playwright who doesn't repeat himself. He's written a Greek comedy, a la Aristophanes, in The Fray, a realistic family drama in Here, a five-act no drama, The Lily's Revenge, a Commedia dell'arte, The Walk Across America for Mother Earth, and he's now doing his bidding on Moliere. <clears throat> He's a lyricist, an actor, a performance artist, a singer who found in Amazing Grace the chord progressions of the House of the Rising Sun, <laughs> and who managed to tie Don't Fence Me In to the murder of Matthew Shepard. And he is a gender toyer with her. <laughs> in my humble estimation, he is the most protean and rigorous, humane, empathic, artist we have. He has an all-embracing vision 
which brings flaws and imperfections into the light in a theater that grapples with shame and fury, knowing that these things are on a continuum with love and tenderness. His work is, as he has said, chaotic, beautiful, ugly, disturbing, male, female, all at once, and it accords dignity and respect to everyone, even Lynn Cheney and Saddam Hussein. <laughs> In these plays, no single character remains the problem for more than a few minutes. He is, as one of his characters accuses another of being an egalitarian empathizer. <laughs> My work is finished here. <laughs> Taylor, um, for those who haven't had a chance to see any of your 24-hour song cycle, you're doing durational work. Yes. That's the wackiest shit I've ever heard about. Please tell these people what that means and why you make it. <laughs> um, all right, so I, I, my first time doing durational, uh, a durational play was The Lily's Revenge. It was five hours long. Uh, depending on the production you saw, sometimes they were four hours. It was four hours long. Um, but, uh, the, and the current piece that I'm working on is called A 24 Decade History of the Pop, uh, Popular Music, um, and where I'm taking a, a decade at a time from the 1770s to the present decade. Um, each decade is about an hour's worth of popular music, and I deconstruct it all and put it back together again. And uh, we're going from the 1770s, right, to the present decade. And, uh, and when we ultimately perform it all, it will be 24 hours long, nonstop. And there'll be 24 musicians on stage with me, and every hour we're going to lose a musician until the final hour is just me, <laughs> having stayed up for 24 hours performing nonstop. And there's going to be food, and um, people are encouraged to bring their toiletries and their bedding. Uh, and there'll be a medical tent. And, <laughs> And we've been doing these decade performances all over the place, and a lot at Joe's Pub and uh, at the Public Theater in New York City, and um, and also at the Museum of Contemporary Art. And I did a tour of Australia with them. So we've been doing them all over the place in Lincoln Center and um, Dixon Place, and uh, so we've been doing them all over in lots of different kinds of venues and um, different sizes. And uh, and I'm just, it's, when I, it's really a 24-hour concert, but really it's a multi-year experience because the idea is that you keep performing each decade in all the various places that you go to um, over the next 10 years. Um, and so people see it and they become part of the community um, <laughs> that we're building. <laughs> Um, but actually, it happens that, it, it, why I love durational work is because this, it does actually happen in this way where if people come back, they get to know each other, audience members get to know each other, and I've had people, um, they've started businesses that have been coming to these concerts in the last two years, uh, two people are getting married, they send me an invite to their wedding. Uh, yeah, um, you know, lots of, lots of things have happened. I, and when I did the Lily's Revenge, people met online because people would hang out in line all day, and they would meet online. And these two people uh, also got married in that experience. And then uh, other two people got divorced as a result of the play. So, um, <laughs> so when you do durational work, it it cracks people out of their. Uh, sometimes it takes more than a 90-minute play to crack people out of their eight-hour workday. And so I like the idea of doing these uh, durational works that just become events and the audience commits to it in a way that um, they don't always commit to just a regular one-act play or two-act play. Uh, instead, they, they really uh, they say, oh, I'm in it. I'm in it for the, for, for the duration. And that means I'm, I'm committed to listening more and opening myself up to the ideas that are being present and to the people around me. So uh, th that's why I'm really interested in the form. Um, and I don't only work in durational work, but, uh, but it, uh, right now it's what excites me. It's kind of a pyramid scheme. <laughs> <laughs> yes, it is. 
it. No, it, do, it does make yeah. you want to come back. It makes you want to go again and mm -hmm. see the next one. And then you have continuity. Right. You've said that imperfection fosters community, and I'd love to know what the hell that means. Ah. Well, um, it sounds really true. I, I, I'm interested in, I, we joke about community all the time because it's, everyone uses the word, it's obnoxious. But I, I really am interested in, in community, not because, it, because of the heart-shaped feeling of it all, but um, because of how dysfunctional it is. Uh, I, I really like, uh, I, um, I really just like, how it works, how it doesn't work. I'm just curious about it. So when I say I'm building community, I'm really um, uh, sure I'm doing that, but I'm in it more for how does this tick? How does it tick? You know, so that's, that's part of what I'm doing. But in terms of how imperfection builds community, um, I don't know. I'm curious about how it does, and that's why I'm making the 24 Decade Concert. Uh, I, I think I have a, a hypothesis that it does. Uh, not to say that imperfection can't, but I think that, for example, a popular song is imperfect in the scope of uh, a range of a classical song and a popular song. Uh, you, they often use imperfect rhymes, and they're, and they're simplistic, and, uh, and their chord structures, and different things like that. So uh, you, could, you could argue that they're imperfect. And what is it that brings people together more uh, than a popular song? So it's that, it's that ability to kind of expose your vulnerability in a way, um, to show your imperfection that I think is bringing lots of, uh, brings people together. Um, I've noticed it on stage a lot that when I expose something of myself that is not perfect, it often makes everybody in the room go like this. Um, as opposed to when I'm doing all my stuff and it's all well crafted and everything, <laughs> sometimes people go like this. So, um, so it's, I'm just curious about it. It's not to say that it's one way of working. Or uh, I, I do believe in in everything on stage, all at the same time, uh, and that includes perfection and trying to trying to reach perfection. Uh, perfection to me, like a classical song, um, is like trying to reach the hem of God. Uh, that's you know reaching for perfection, and um, to me, a, a popular song is uh, trying to reach the people, and so um, both are interesting. That's but that's where I'm at. It's all through your work this sense of the flaws, the frailty. You find such humanity and comedy in the ways that we are complete hypocrites <laughs> and uh, fuck up. There are children here. No, I told them. Oh, good. No. The way we fuck up. Um, I not... said I wanted an adult afternoon. Excellent, excellent. I love children. <laughs> not all the time. <laughs> <laughs> no, I just think sometimes we cater our culture to children way more than we should, and you know, blah, 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 blah. You guys know, whatever. <laughs> and I wanted to be able to talk about sex. Honestly, that's true, because that's a big part of what I do in, on the stage. So um, <laughs> I, I wanted to be able to talk about it. Well, now that you've said that, um, <laughs> you very glancingly mentioned to me once that attending orgies. <laughs> Let's get into it. Uh, actually, <laughs> pardon the expression spurred you on to <laughs> artistic uh, horizons. Did I say that? <laughs> I think you said that it triggered something artistically. So I started, in the, I started in the theater, and it seemed to me, although this probably wasn't true, but from my perspective, it seemed to me that I couldn't find my way in, that the gatekeeping was so intense, I, I couldn't find my way in. And um, so I went to the clubs where they'd take anybody. Because, I, because Mercedes Rule came to my class, my acting class one time, and she said she tried to get in every school she could, try, she could get into. She auditioned for every school, and they turned her down for everything. And so she went to the um, HB Studios, where they accept anyone. And I said, OK. And I, it was such a beautiful talk that she gave. And I said, right, I'm going to, uh, that's what I got to do. I got to, um, 
I'll go where they'll take anyone. So I went to the clubs and they would take anyone. And um, at the clubs I would be performing and there would be orgies happening in front of me. And it wasn't like um, the continental baths. It was where they're off in the other rooms or anything like that. It was like right in front. And, um, and so I really learned a lot in that world. <laughs> I'm not saying I didn't partake sometimes, but I, I, I really learned that uh, I really learned that if something is threatening to take the story away from the storyteller, then it is your job to incorporate that threatening thing into the story at all costs. So I incorporated lots of blowjobs into my performances. <laughs> and, um, you know, I've got my ukulele and I just sing by, while they're, where they're doing it. And then everyone watches me while they're watching them. You know, so, um, so it was a way of working that, uh, it, it taught me how to be spontaneous on the stage. It taught me uh, how to always live in the moment um, when you got drunk, screaming people, uh, and you, you got to tell a story. Um, and they came for the story, but they don't always know it. You know, they, it, they don't, they, they come, because once the, once the show is over, they would immediately leave. So they come for the show, but they, sometimes people get distracted by life and sex, <laughs> and they, uh, they would indulge in that. And so the trick was always to figure out a, a way to work in whatever environment. And that has really done me service, that training, um, because I've been able to play tents and uh, basement bars and opera houses and, uh, and all different kinds of theaters inside and out as a result. You know. Well, this brings me to something you wrote in your manifesto that I love, which is that the theater is a service industry. It's like being a plumber and theater artists are blue collar workers who wear better clothes for the most part. I believe theater artists should be students of humanity. I believe to learn what your audience needs is the job, but caution that sometimes we confuse need with want. Giving our audiences what they want is not the job. I believe you may be saying to yourself, that's very presumptuous of him to think he knows what the audience needs. But I believe if I were a plumber, you wouldn't think it was presumptuous of me to say, my job is to learn what your plumbing needs. You would say I was a good plumber. That is so refreshing. <laughs> uh, when I moved to New York, I was taken under the wing of Stephen Sondheim, who said, the audience doesn't tell you what they want. You tell them what they want. And that was very uh, eye-opening to me. And I have always uh, carried a certain contempt for the audience in my manner. <laughs> Because after all, they are paying me, and that's infuriating. <laughs> Taylor, you've also said that we must communicate with everybody. You can't exclude anyone in the audience. That means if there's a right-wing loony at your performance, you have to find a way to communicate to them. Yeah. How do you do that? It starts with the beginning. It's always about the invitation to listen. So, um, I'm trying to think of an example. Uh, well, with the, with the show that I, I would do a long time, it was called The Beast of Taylor Mac. And uh, um, I would come on stage, and it was, I was crazy looking in my theatrical uh, drag. And I, um, and it was kind of the beginning of the whole piece was funny, 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 funny. So everyone comes on board. Uh, and then once everybody's on board, then you can bring in the other stuff. You know, you can bring in the, the darker material. And, um, and so that's part of the equation. Uh, it's also just to always keep an ear out for what's happening in the room. Um, Again, I, I was in Australia, uh, in Darwin, Australia, which is a real, it's a mining town and military town. And there was a guy and his wife had obviously brought him to the show and he was like, mm, you know, from the very beginning, he was not going to enjoy this show with this drag queen on this stage. Um, and I, uh, I had to acknowledge him. Uh, 
Um, and I try to do it in a generous way so he doesn't feel put on the spot. But, uh, but he, was, he was taking the story away from the storyteller. So the, the trick is to just acknowledge what he's going through right now. So I often will just say, wow, you really hate this show. You know? <laughs> and then we'll talk about it. And, um, and it usually works out. Uh, because they they feel seen and heard. Uh, now sometimes it, um, and that's all they wanted. That's all they wanted was to be seen and heard. He f he felt like there was no room for him in this show. Uh, and then I just said, oh, there is. I just made room for him in the show. So um, that can be complicated sometimes because you don't want uh, a certain prejudice to take over your work. And so it's a constant juggling act. And I do this in my plays that I write, too, that there's, at least the ones that I perform in, I, I, um, I definitely leave room for there to be some sense of, let me check in with what the audience, what's happening in the audience right now. Um, if it's a realism play, I, I'm, I still try to invite the audience into it as best I can. We were doing this play at San Francisco at the Magic, a, a new play of mine, and, the, and we were in previews, and the beginning was horrible. In my head, it worked. And then the audience got in, and, it, and, I, and I thought it was the actors in rehearsal. I thought, oh, the actors aren't making this work. Um, and then I realized in the first preview, oh, this is horrible. This is why it doesn't work. It's all in my head that, that the comic timing would be there if they got it, but I realized this, I'm not inviting the audience into it. Um, and so I rewrote, I was so proud of myself, I rewrote the, the opening of the play at intermission. <laughs> I was just, I was so jazzed, I you know, had this, and it really it was just about giving them a little bit more time. Romulus Linney was a, a mentor of mine, and he, he would say, he took me to the library at one point, and he, he said, Taylor, look at all the plays that have been around for more than 100 years. And in every single one of those plays, you'll see that they start the play off slowly, because the audience is still getting comfortable. And, I, and he said, you can start it off fast, but then you got to start it really slow right after that quickness. And, um, and uh, you know, I, you always have to remind yourself about these techniques that you learn. And I, and I was starting to play off fast. And so I just had to ease them into it. I had to tell them that it, it's kind of a hoarder home uh, that they are entering. So they're already uncomfortable by looking at it. And then I just had to let the, the, the mother of the play acknowledge that it's a hoarder's home and it's awful and that everyone should be disturbed by it. Then suddenly everyone could laugh and it was OK. Um, so you learn these little techniques that are quite useful. Every, everything about this play, if you get a chance to see it, is in a lineage with The Glass Menagerie and Buried Child and Long Day's Journey Into Night. It is a family play in which the American landscape is held up for scrutiny. But this play takes place actually now, not in a nostalgic version of America. It takes place now with a bunch of people who don't know what gender pronouns to use to refer to people who are changing their genders. And more radically than that, the ethical center of the play, the humane aspects of the play, reside in the heteronormative bullying father and his Iraq war veteran dishonorably discharged crystal meth addicted son. <laughs> and the progressive characters in the play are in many ways not so nice. They have no room for people who are carrying the old forms into the future. No room. They literally kick them out. They don't belong in the house anymore. And so the play leaves you with a tragic sense that if we aren't careful, we will throw the baby out with the bathwater I've never seen that on stage before. I've never seen it from a progressive artist. And it convinced me that in all the world, among English-speaking playwrights, the greatest living one since Beckett died is Taylor Mack. 
And not only that, he's a great lyricist. Listen to this. This is from a play, like, from now. This isn't John Webster, though you wouldn't know it. <laughs> the floating down of flower tree to be as tears descend, decree the cheek home, but with the weight of all they learn, must cling, then fall, and seek to roam, disperse upon the earth, adjourn from yearning tomes. A flower falls much faster than a wish, and so our longings lay, are late, lost, and we are left to know our fate, to land, to lose, to ache, and so we'll die upon the grating frost. And I would rather end my life with all the sound, the wind as fife abound, with all the smells of morning air, to see the sun arise and blare its color all about the world in this last moment we've unfurled the beauty of what can be here it takes away all that i fear from death oh the breadth floating down <laughs> it's a song, so. girl girl <laughs> now at the beginning of this play <laughs> girl Time appears, and time has um, hourglasses here that are slowly emptying, and as the sand floats out, her breasts are revealed. <laughs> That's good. And there are these crack hoes on stage, and they're former audience members who were not able to leave. <laughs> the play has turned them into degenerates. Um, this makes me so happy. And Taylor comes and sits in the audience as a lily. And time says, look, get out of here. You don't want to be here. This is about longing, and it's going to trap you. This story was it, the nostalgia. The god of nostalgia has trapped these, this audience in this cock and bull story with institutionalized narrative. <laughs> Little by little, they have turned from lively, questioning individuals like you to cliché crones of mediocrity, wool-gathering junkies of wistfulness. Escape now, or the telling of this tale will reduce you to an addicted coagulation of nostalgia and hope. So, and then he says, um, <laughs> this play will use the promise of a climax, a climax in the shape of the most banal and contemptible contrivance of all, the wedding. <laughs> And then the lily, who represents all audiences, says, there'll be a wedding! <laughs> Come on, what do you want from theater anyway? <laughs> Taylor, you said two, the two new plays are part of a larger project, and I'm really interested in what that is. You haven't mentioned that. Mm. Well, um, I am writing... Uh, well, the Greeks had these... You guys all know, it's an audience of people who know. Uh, they had these play festivals, right? And they would do three tragedies and a comedy and the play, and they would do them all day long, right? And that's, uh, they, um, those were their festivals. And so I decided that I've been trying to figure out a way to do rep. Uh, because I come from uh, um, a theater, I, I produce a lot of my own stuff in New York City because it, it tends to be the kind of thing where you got to do it first before people will do it because they don't think it can be done. So then you got to do it. So you do it, and then everyone's like, "Oh, you can do it." And um, and before that, they're like, "You're not going to be able to do that. You can't do that. You can't do that. Nobody wants to do that. No one wants it." One time, I, I said to this person, who, uh, "The Lily's Revenge." I was like, "It's five hours long," and she said, "That's just selfish." <laughs> I said, I'm not going to tie you to the chair. Like, you can leave if you hate it. You know, um, so, you know, they tell you you can't do it. You can't do it. So then you do it, and then people like it, and some people don't, but most people did. And, uh, and then other people will do it, right? And so, I don't know, I forgot what I was saying. <laughs> but it's, well, larger project. Yeah, so oh, the larger project is, I wanted to create this rep company because in my producing myself, I, People were talking earlier today, they were like, we had, you know, at your 10th preview, you know, you might want to rewrite some things. And I was like, 10th preview? I've, I usually get one preview. 
one preview before the critics come, you know? So uh, I've been trying to figure out how can I make my plays last longer because I've been touring a lot and I will do one of my solo pieces for 200 times and, and on performance number 75, I'm like, oh yeah, I think I understand how to do this play now. Um, and so, so the ensemble stuff doesn't quite get that uh, life in it. There are you know, usually 16 performances or whatever and it's out. And so I've, how can I have longer runs? And what I used to do with my solo stuff is do it once a week um, in the basement bars for six months. Uh, and, and so I thought, well, how could I do that model? And I thought, well, I'll, I'll write these four plays and I'll do a Greek, go back to the Greeks. You always got to go to the root, right? That's what Robin Kelly says, go to the root. So you go to the root, you go to the Greeks, and, and they would do these all-day festivals. And I thought, well, that's a way maybe that I could have things run in rep because if I can't, um, if I can't produce it, a show, one show that will last for six months, maybe I could produce four shows that combined will last for six months. So that's kind of my crazy theory. Uh, and in the, in the process, I'm, I'm premiering all the plays separately, but then hopefully in New York we'll get to do them in some kind of rep, either at four different theaters or uh, all together at one theater, and um, that's kind of the goal. So I've written two of them so far. One is called Here, which we premiered at the Magic Theater. Uh, just this last February. And then the other one, uh, the Children's Theater Company uh, in Minneapolis is um, it, it commissioned it. It's called The Fray, uh, and it's an all ages play. Um, and then there's two more. I'm doing a musical version of The Bacchae, and then uh, uh, the fourth one um, is. Uh, a kind of performance art play. So, so, the, so the, there's some variety there, and, and also they're all about kind of the. Uh, the American experience. <laughs> That's what they're about. <laughs> the, fray the Fray takes place in the interstice between a platonic heaven and a very muddy, dirty, real America, where people roll around in the mud. And the stage is filled with mud. And the audience is dragged onto the stage and pushed in the mud. <laughs> I've never been happier. I love that. And they make the audience, members of the audience, pick up bunches of mud and pretend to poop. Now, let me just say, <laughs> I'm a little poop phobic. I still do not believe that women actually do poop. I'm told that they do, but I don't, I refuse to believe it. And I know I'm a horrible, horrible sexist ha hate, hater, but um, <laughs> I'm just admitting my flaws. Anyway, you have never ever laughed as hard as you will laugh when you read this play because it invites the world into the kind of piggy headed <laughs> Philistines <laughs> that we want not to be. And it presents the perfect queer as a rather, at first, unlikable fellow. He speaks in rhymed couplets. He's been living in the platonic heaven. And the play slow, and it makes you love these pig people who are running around in the mud. And the play slowly shifts the scale so that the one goes down and the other goes up and the person who wants to live in a perfect world realizes he'd rather stay in the mud and the person who lives in the mud realizes that he has terrible fears. And fear is always really the villain in Taylor Max plays. Like in life, people do the worst things when they're paralyzed with fear. That's a great play, and it is the, the miracle of Taylor Mac, and I guess really the writer that you resemble the most, I think in many ways, is Brecht, because you use comedy and vaudeville and burlesque to convey ideas in a way that they don't seem like ideas, they feel like lived life. And you simply refuse to bore the audience. Every 10 seconds, you surprise them. I don't know how you do that. I can't keep my own focus for 10 seconds. The internet has destroyed every last synapse. 
That's, um, a, that's a Buffon thing, you know, that, I mean, Red Bastard talks about that, if you know him, Eric Davis, he's a wonderful Buffon. And he, he says, you know, I, I don't know how many seconds he says, but he's like, something interesting has to happen every 10 seconds, you know? And uh, I take that to mean, um, that could be a, a combination of words that's surprising. It could mean something drastic that happens. A flood descends on the stage. Uh, it could mean a kiss. It could mean just a breath. It, uh, but something surprising happens because surprise is when people actually feel something. Um, and so your job is to surprise the audience. The perfect queer in the fray turns out to portray a cockney, lovesick, crazy, killer, homosexual clown. <laughs> I'm not making that up. And that's better than Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtle, I think. Um, Taylor, talk a little bit about, uh, you shared with me your approach to building a character, the duality of a performer and an actor. Um, well, I was trained in Method uh, and Meisner primarily. And um, I, I like that has really served me quite well. Um, but I, I learned in the clubs uh, that there is something quite special about the duality of seeing both the character and the performer at the same time. That there's something extremely brave about that. Um, not to say that hiding in the character, or I don't like to use the word hiding, but uh, dissolving into a character isn't also brave, but, and has its beautiful merits. But, the, but showing, finding yourself in the character in front of an audience is really deep. And um, it works ex extremely well for things like Brecht, uh, which I learned this year. Um, and a lot of the plays that I write, ha the characters have that duality where it's the, it's the performer and, uh, and the character at the same time. I saw a play, I won't say w what it was, but I, I saw a musical where um, they, they, they were asked to be the characters. And as a result, uh, you, everything was cut off. It, it, you didn't, you didn't, it just, it just was dead. It was so dead on that stage and there was nothing authentic was happening. And that's the challenge, right, when you play a character is to find the authentic thing, but um, so often I see the theater that, where people are trying to hide themselves uh, in the character and it's just, it's such a relief when somebody shows themselves in the character, so. And because when you discover yourself through the character, then the audience can discover themselves through the character, right? Right, that's the, that's the joy of it, so. Um, and it's all about discovery. You're just trying to discover. I say this to actors in my plays all the time. Discover that moment, discover it, discover it, discover it. You know, and I think about that as I'm writing. The, the great joys I have when writing is when I discover something rather than when I try to tell something. Or um, it's always about the action, you know. But still, what I'm hearing you say and what excites me, and I think it does come from the clubs, it is a live audience. It's not a movie, it's not television. It's not frozen. It should change. They're a character. They're either breathing with you or they're not. You know if they're not. Yeah. And you have to find a way to let them in. That's what's special about it. So to pretend they're not there is false in a way. It's a balancing act. Yeah. You've said that audience participation, you like, uh, when you use audience participation, you want them to be uncomfortable. <laughs> Again, a man after my own heart. Um, why do you want them to be uncomfortable? I don't think that we go, I don't think that art makes people comfortable. I mean, Edward Albee talks about, you know, art is about uh, attacking the status quo. And whatever that means, uh, that doesn't necessarily mean a group of people, but it means whatever your status quo is in you. And, and um, I do think that that's 
a lovely way to view art um, is that it's not about being comfortable. So, but what you can say to an audience is, it's okay if you're uncomfortable, right? So I say, I say, come and participate on the stage, and and everyone goes, eh. <laughs> and, and I and I say, yes, that everything you're feeling is appropriate, you know. And then we get them up on the stage, and and then they can have a transformation, um, which is the best thing that art does. Is we have, we get to discover a transformation in the space, and so I did this one song in the Twenty Four Decade Show, which is a the the. Lyric is, because they cannot sing, because they cannot sing, three roguish chaps fell into mishaps because they could not sing. So I, I get the audience to, everyone who's in the audience who can't sing to raise their hand, and then we, get to, we decide who's the worst three singers in the audience, <laughs> and then we get them up on the stage, and we teach them the chorus, and they sing the chorus really badly, and the audience cheers them, and suddenly that, that wound that they have in their heart that they can't sing is eliminated from the space, and there is a transformation. So um, I like to use ritual in, in the theater, because that's what I think it is, and, but ritual requires sacrifice, and often that sacrifice, or my audience, uh, the sacrifice is comfort, you know, comfort is often the sacrifice, or ideology, or, or you know. You have found ways to make people accept their humanity in their frailty and flawedness and awkwardness. We all feel like we're totally weird broken things, and you say, yes, you really are. And that's what I think is genius. It's you have a vision of what art can be, which is what's lacking in most theater, not just commercial theater. I cannot tell you now that I'm writing musicals how often I hear the question, will the audience understand that? I don't know what to say to that question, except if mean? not, I'm constantly being asked by producers, will the audience understand this? Mm -hmm. And uh, the only answer I can think of is, I hope so. <laughs> right. Right. Do you never get asked that by artistic directors? Yeah, and dramaturgs a lot. <laughs> um, but I love my dramaturgs. I love them. Um, I do because I didn't go to I didn't go to playwriting school. I went to dramaturgy hangout, you know. Um, and so my dramaturgs are, you know, they taught me uh, what they told me what to read, you know. So I love I love the dramaturgs, uh, and I really feel like I work well with them. Um, not all of them. But uh, <laughs> the good ones I work well with. And, um, uh, I, I, but I guess they asked me that, but I, I, I guess I think that's a fair question to ask. It is a fair think? question. It's just that when the presumption is it's an intelligent line, it uh, might be oh, too much for oh, them. Oh, no, then, then tell them to fuck off. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, really. You know, everybody loves The Simpsons, and they don't know that uh, Matt Granick had a, a, a deal with Fox that uh, they could never say, cut that line because the audience won't understand the reference. So everybody loves it because there's references always in it that some of the audience doesn't understand, which is why you pay attention, yeah. and why at the intermission of a good play, you turn to your friends and you go, what was the thing about Plato? I don't know about Plato. And then there's a conversation. Right. If you're telling them what they already know, I'm preaching then, to the converted. Well then, yeah. Taylor, I have so many hundreds of questions I could ask you. I would, if you, if you form a, a repertory company, please invite me to participate. Um, we're going to open the uh, questions up to you. And Taylor is going to pick you, people who are talking, and I'll just sit here. I just want to, I just, well, before we do that, I just want to thank Craig. Oh. I, I will say that when I was, I'm, very excited that he was going to do this with me because when I was young and I was trying to find my own voice, I, I basically just copied Craig's voice. And um, now I do my own voice, but uh, I feel like. I liked it better when you were doing my voice. I still like, I feel like it's still in there. And it's, <laughs> it's a real, he's the real deal. <laughs> Thank you.
Don't hurry. Don't rush. Quest. Where's the ukulele? You know, I'm learning the banjo. Oh, wow. Uh, so I'm trying not to play the ukulele too much because I, I chose the ukulele for a reason, which was that the um, I was so gigantic and the ukulele was so small and I wanted that dichotomy, um, that juxtaposition. And, I, and so um, that's why I was playing it. It's, I, I, it's a sweet instrument, it's fine. I like it also because it's not cool, you know. Um, but then it became, the burlesque movement kind of, neo-burlesque movement came up and everyone started playing the ukulele and it kind of became semi-cool. And so it's lost a little bit of its magic for me and, and purpose. So, uh, and the banjo is cool too right now, so I don't know, but I, I just was craving a different sound, so I, I didn't bring it. <laughs> what the? Yeah. Yeah, um, I don't want to produce my own work. I love it when other people produce my work. Um, I love myself some Loretta Greco and uh, <laughs> the Magic Theater. And all, you know, um, I, but I, I do it. I mean, I'll, I'll say, I, I also love Adam Bach. I love myself some Adam Bach. He had this play I saw. It was four character play, single set, and they had, I think, a month and a half to preview. You know, it was 90 minutes. And I was doing this play that had 14 characters, musical numbers, lots of changes, you know, all this, lots of pastiching all over the place, and I had, you know, one day to preview. So I would love to have producers because I feel like the work needs that time to be able to rewrite, and I'm a rewriter. So, but that's not really answering your question. Um, I guess what I, I want people to do is trust a little bit more. Um, I, I feel like I see artists all over the place, independent artists that prove themselves over and over and over and over and over and over again. And then you hear things from institutions like, our audience isn't ready for you yet. You know, and that to me is, um, well, they'll never be ready if you don't invite me. You know, so I feel like we could do that a bit more, just trust. Uh, if somebody is committed to this art form and shown and proven time and time again that they, they know what they're doing, then maybe we could just trust them and, and book it, you know? Um, I'm a real fan. I'm a real fan in giving people dates. Don't tell me, uh, submit your play and we'll let you know. No, give me a date. Give me a date and I will make a play for you and do the play and it will be amazing. <laughs> and if it's not, oh well, but half of your shows aren't amazing anyway, so. <laughs> you know. <laughs> Sorry. I, I, I carry your remarkable performance in Good Person of Szechuan in my heart. Oh, thank you. And I, I wonder what you carry with you after having done that. After ha doing that play? Yeah. It was a, it was a really hard, I, I haven't had that hard of a time doing a, a, a playing a role before. Um, I, I had stress rash. I had a stress rash uh, because what a lot of people don't know about actors is um, your body doesn't know the difference between pretend and real S stress. So um, I, every day I would, uh, you know, uh, meet the gods, uh, start a business, uh, fall in love, break up, get pregnant, you know, blah 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 blah, blah. Um, and uh, and. You do that eight times a week, that's a producer's schedule, that eight shows a week thing. That is not an actor's schedule. <laughs> and so you do that eight times a week and it, uh, it's very taxing. And so I had to really learn 
uh, how to take care of myself in that process. And I do like five hour plays, and I'm used to knowing how to take care of myself, but it was a different experience, that one. Um, I, think I'm, I think I'm still kind of recovering from it a little bit. Um, and not to say I wouldn't have done it again or do it again. It was a glorious experience. And uh, I think that the, in terms of the themes of the play, I, I am constantly now looking around and, and uh, asking how I can be a better person, and, um, but also how I cannot shame myself and everyone else around me. There's a lot of shame that we're doing. We're constantly shaming everybody. So I'm trying to figure that out, too. I, I mean, the, and I just fell in love with Brecht. I didn't fall in love with Brecht before, and I fell in love with Brecht. So that was a big present. Um, I'm Jed Harper. Uh, and something that I've noticed lately is that society is just starting to talk about this concept of the gender binary and sort of that it shouldn't exist. Um, and I wanted to ask you, what's it like uh, performing and writing to that dialogue, and what can you say to those of us who want to participate through theater? Um, hopefully there'll be a place for you in the producing theater. And until there is, make it yourself. Don't wait around. Don't ask permit for permission to be creative. Just go make it yourself. And because you make it, then there will be a place for it, right? Um, that's the trend that's happening. Everything, everybody's presenting now. So make it yourself, and then someone will present you. It's the trend in the American theater. Uh, people aren't producing as much anymore. They're presenting. Um, and, and so get yourself a company and start making, that, start making it. Uh, raise the money to, if you're not a writer, raise the money to commission a writer to, to do it, you know? Um, I, I, that's all I can really s say about it. Uh, it's, it, it's odd. Right now, I, I thought I made this big breakthrough with good person and, and stuff, but I, and I thought, oh, everyone's going to be asking me to play all these roles that I don't normally get to play because I show that I can do it time and time and time and time again. But, you know, and all I've gotten are narrator roles or gender roles, you know. So you will find that, um, People will put you in the box and you, uh, say no. Say no to things um, if you don't want to be in the box. Say no and make it something else. That's what I do. Thank you. Go ahead. Hi, Taylor. How are you doing? Uh, once upon a time, you spoke about uh, Sherlocking your work so that it's coded. Uh, the pain that you've been working, feel on the inside has, is coded within your, your storytelling. Can you speak a little bit more about that? Oh, yeah. Um, well, I, 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 sometimes I'll say, well, what's the one thing I don't want the audience to know about me? And then I'll say, OK, that's what the show's about. Um, <laughs> and it's one technique. You, know. you could also say, what's the one thing I want everyone to know about me? <laughs> but but I, it, when you risk something like that uh, on stage, I think it brings people together um, and presents an idea in a way that is uh, tangible often. So I, but what I like to do, and the great thing about the theater is you can say all those horrible things that have happened to you or that you are, that are you, the awful things that you do in the world, um, but they don't necessarily know it's true. I think this is what you're talking about. Um, so because the theater is both lie and truth at the same time. So they don't really know if it's true or not. Um, so you're protected in that way. Um, and I had, in Meisner work, they always would say, I don't know if everyone does this, but my teacher would say, you know, Sherlock Holmes text, Sherlock Holmes the text. So you basically would say, um, uh, there'd be a, 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 your dialogue is, I'm going to the store, you know, and so you say, going, and then you kind of do stream of consciousness off of go, of the word going, and then you do stream of consciousness off the store. What does that mean? Um, and so you, you Sherlock Holmes the text, and so I write that way so that our actors and directors and designers can Sherlock Holmes the text and find the clues of the character within the text, um, and also the the clues of, uh, of what may or may not be true. Thank you. Yeah. 
Hi, so I don't particularly have a question, but I'd like to say that I'm a high school student from an art school in Oakland, and this past February, our theater department took a trip to the Magic Theater to see here, and um, it was really important to me and to a bunch of my friends, the topics that you were able to broach in that play, and just the exposure of those topics that was gained through the production of this play in this community, and um, it really meant a lot to me and my peers um, to have that experience, and it was the only time in my education that the topic of gender neutrality and questioning your gender had been broached ever, and to have it in that context of theater that I am so passionate about really meant a lot to me, so thank you. Thank you, Thank you, Thank your teacher for taking you and the Magic Theater for making it happen. Yeah, thanks. Thank you. We didn't talk about how my, my gender pronoun is Judy. Um, and I chose Judy because people often judge you when you have a gender pronoun that's not he or her or him. Uh, and I don't feel like a her or him. I do feel gender queer. And so, I, I, but when I, if people were going to judge me when they use my gender pronoun, like roll their eyes when they say my name, I wanted a gender pronoun that would make them camp while they were doing it. Hi, Miss Judy. Yesterday we had some great top, uh, speakers talk about the mountaintop. When we get there, what are we going to do when we get to our mountaintop? What are we going to do? What are you? I, that's my question to you. What do you, what do you think our mountaintop is? Where are we going? Where are you going? And what are you? What's the idealized version you'd like to see? Uh, a celebration of heterogeneity, as opposed to homogeneity. Um, I guess that would be kind of amazing. Um, I would love it if we stopped trying to always see ourselves in all the stories, needing to see ourselves in the stories, and instead just having a little curiosity about people who are different. Um, that, would be, that would be pretty cool if we could do that. I guess that's my, <laughs> that would be my mountaintop. A little more egalitarianism in the theater. <laughs> Thanks. <laughs> Anything else? <laughs> Good. Oh. Uh, I want to be in a lot of new plays. So I don't know what those roles are. But I know they're not narrators. And they don't all have to do with gender. I do know that. Um, I want Karen Hartman to write me a play. Uh, <laughs> I want Jordan Harrison to write me a play. I want, uh, you know, I want a lot of my friends from New Dramatists, my fellow playwrights, to write me parts in their plays. Um, I want, uh, I want to play. Uh, Edmund and Edgar in King Lear. I'm really eager. I really want to play Edgar. Because when do you get to be the fool and the hero at the same time? Um, you know, but it's a, uh, you have to convince people that what you know of yourself is what they know of yourself. And I don't audition. I don't audition for the theater. I don't believe in auditioning. I don't do it. I don't believe in gambling. I don't like to gamble. Um, and I gambled for seven years, and it didn't pay off. I tried to get auditions for seven years. I could barely get any. Uh, so I just stopped auditioning. I just don't believe in it. I just make the work and do the work. But it does mean that I don't get cast in a lot of things that I would like to do. So um, I just, you know, trust me, I'll figure it out. I have never once been so bad on the stage that people didn't to kind of like me, right? 
I've been bad on the stage, but I've never been so bad on the stage. <laughs> I, I want it to be good. So I'm not going to get, I'm not going to say yes to something that I really don't think I can make it good, you know? So just cast me and if I don't think I can do it, I'll tell you, you know? But I mean, that plays both ways because Lyra de Bassonet, she cast me as Shantae and I said, I don't know how to do this and then I, you know, she was like, yes you do and so we did it. But, so it works both ways. Sometimes I don't know, but. We have time for one more question. And I'll just say, that's not just me. I mean, I said that about me, but that's a lot of people, a lot of people in this industry. Uh, just trust them, just cast them. I, I, we did all the Lilies of Vengeance in San Francisco. We didn't cast a single role. We didn't do uh, auditions. We just cast, we just, I met with people. I was like, oh, someone recommended you. Okay, great, let's do it. And I just trusted them. Some of them worked out and some of them didn't, but that's true of any play, of any casting process. So I'm a big fan of not having auditions and just trusting artists and, and saying, yes, you are an artist. You've proven you can do it time and time again. Let me dedicate some time uh, and opportunity for you. And I, I believe that. And that's going to help us with our diversity issue. Hi, Todd. Hi. Oh, so I... um, Todd is directing a play of <laughs> mine. Uh, not mine. Uh, we're doing a production of The Maids. Daniel Alexander Jones, Luis Alfaro, and I are doing The Maids, and Todd is directing it. <laughs> <laughs> we decided last night. Oh, okay, I was afraid to ask you my question, but now I'm not afraid to. But I want to make a statement first. I just want to say, Craig, thank you for the beautiful reading of another playwright's work. Yeah. That was really astonishing and attentive. Uh, and deeply loving. Um, so my question, Taylor, which now I am not afraid to ask you, is will you sing us a song? Oh. <laughs> no, don't you do that to me, Oh, you would think I would know 240 songs because I'm memorizing them for my concert. Um, I, I was, this is a little a cappella one. Uh, I remember. We've nothing to fear but fear itself. Fear itself. Fear itself. We've nothing to fear but fear itself. Fear itself. Itself. Well, I'm afraid of fear itself. Fear itself, fear itself. I'm afraid of fearful people and violence from fearful people. I'm afraid of politicians and ammunition and all religions. I'm afraid of nationalism and patriotism and jingoism, and I'm afraid of all alone, all alone, all alone. But we've nothing to fear but fear itself, fear itself, itself. Beautiful. Thank you, Taylor. Thank you, Craig. Thanks for leaving us with a reminder to take risks, to not fear, to be curious, to not be forced to check a box or to be in a box. And I want to introduce Loretta to the stage. Loretta Greco is the producing artistic director of the Magic Theater. On the very first day of my very first TCG conference, 200 years ago, 
My mentor, Emily Mann, took me urgently by the elbow and began pushing me through the crowds of my future colleagues and theater luminaries with great agility. When I asked where she was taking me, she stopped and with an unusual display of humility and awe, replied, I'm taking you to meet Peter. Peter, of course, was the great Peter Zeisler, the father of our tribe who dreamt of a regional theater movement outside of Broadway and then rolled up his sleeves and built it. The Peter Zeisler Memorial Award recognizes an individual or organization whose work reflects and promotes Peter's vision and artistic integrity. The honorees exemplify pioneering practices in theater, are dedicated to the freedom of expression, and are unafraid of taking risks for the advancement of the art form. Past winners of the Zeisler Award include Kenan Valdez, Will Power, 24th Street Theater, Jack Ruler, Mildred Ruiz and Stephen Sapp, Elevator Repair Service, and the Foundry Theater. This year's winner is the fearless changemaker, Taylor Mack. Whether you have experienced his recent and definitive conjurings of Puck, Shante, or the hopeful Lily, or been transported by the angelic longing of Taylor's voice and ukulele in concert, or had your DNA altered by his insightful work as a playwright, or are getting your first dose of Taylor today, you know that he's breaking new ground. Taylor's a raucous community builder who knows inclusion is not just desirous, but essential. After a decade of trying to be invited to the party, Taylor threw his own. Through his joyful drag revolution, he began creating a body of cabaret and concert work, which broke down barriers in favor of posing possibilities. As a playwright, he began to enlist the audience to reconsider the idea of community within both content and form. With his largest work to date, he threw out the model of auditioning and instead invited a group of passionate and diverse clowns, drag queens, faux drag queens, musicians, politicians, strippers, dancers, singers, and yes, even a few actors to star in his Lily's Revenge. Taylor's ingenuity, theatrical vision, artistic integrity, and passion for taking risks is undeniable. Who else would emulate the Japanese no play to create a five hour, five act, 40 char character epic allegory in order to subversively and yes, communally explore who has the right to love, who has the right to marry. Only Taylor would risk following the flamboyant lilies with his latest play here, a staggering redreaming of Shepard, which explores trans transgender odyssey inside the broken promises of middle-class America. I love this man. I love Judy. Every time he walks into my theater, he makes me want to be a better artist and a better person. He has a way of making you want to raise the bar just a little bit higher. Taylor knows who he is, and he truthfully and generously brings it all to the table. The sublime and the ridiculous, the masculine and the feminine, the fabulousness and the humility in order to make heightened theatrical works that have the power to alter us. In communion with his audience, he engenders his own brand of joyful abandon while also demanding the emotional rigor required for real change. Taylor passionately believes as we, believes we as artists are responsible for dreaming a better, more inclusive world. And then, like Peter Zeisler, rolling up our sleeves and leading our culture towards it. Please join me in celebrating the 2014 recipient of the Peter Zeisler Memorial Award, the incomparable Taylor Mack.
<laughs> Deja vu. Um, I don't want to say too much because I just was talking for a long time, but um, I did want to say that my mom is here. And, <laughs> and uh, Shirley, Fi uh, Shirley Fishman, <laughs> Shirley Fishman was, uh, she's one of those dramaturgs that I love. And she said to me, uh, Taylor, what made you? you know, Taylor, what made you? That's how she talks. And, um, and, I, and I said, well, what do you mean? And she's like, you know, why, how did you become who you became? Huh? And, um, and I, said, <laughs> I said, well, my mom, there was always creativity in the home. Always. It was always encouraged. There was always lots of creativity. And she said, also, you didn't come out of a Petri dish? And that basically sums it up in terms of the Ben Franklin uh, concept of the self-made man is <laughs> not actually true. Um, I do want to say this too real quick. Uh, yesterday, I was really excited to come here and I saw all these people that I know. I was introducing them to my mom and, and then uh, I came in here, and the, the event started, and, uh, <laughs> and Teresa <laughs> said, would everyone please stand for the national anthem? And I'm not really a patriot, <laughs> you know, so I, but I stood, I was like, I guess I'm going to stand, I'm in San Diego, you know, military town, I'm going to do it, you know, and, um, and uh, I hadn't been, I realized I hadn't been asked to stand for the national anthem for at least 20 years because I don't go to sporting events and I don't have a kid, so I don't go to school events where they ask you to stand and things. So it'd been 20 years since I'd been asked to stand and I felt like a teenager again, kind of angry about um, having to, angry about this nation and the world that we're living in and, and why should I be proud, proud of this country and blah, 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 blah. And, uh, and I, w I wanted to rebel against it all. And my mom, who's a patriot, she was kind of humming along. And the people in the back were um, kind of singing along a little bit, but kind of quietly, because they knew they were at a theater thing. And they felt a little shame about they were being, we're subversively singing to the national anthem. <laughs> you know. And um, so they weren't really like shouting it out. There was conflict in the room. you know. And, and I, I said, I'm going to look at my friend Shanta, and how we're going to rebel is we're going to roll our eyes, you know. And I looked at Shanta, and she wasn't looking at me. I got Shanta, look at me, but she didn't look at me. And uh, so then I was stewing and stewing, and I thought, well, and then I realized, oh, this is, um, because Shanta was telling this story about going to the border and seeing uh, the border go off into the ocean and how they... <sighs> They used to have chain link fences so that uh, the family members that had been deported could come and at least touch their loved ones and pass letters to them and um, kiss them. Uh, and now they've even stopped that and there's just a little hole that you can stick your finger through and they've cut down the hours that they can even do that. And we're using our nationalism as a way to, um, to shore up our culture of fear, and we're using our culture of fear uh, to put borders around, and we're, and we're stopping people from actually, um, we're, we're using our nationalism to, to be cruel to people in ways that we were cruel before, and we're being even crueler. And so I thought, why should we be proud of this? But then I thought that, uh, that you know, it's obviously it's kind of lovely to be in a country where you get to um, have those thoughts and express them on a stage, and uh, even though half the country might attack you for it, but still, you know, you want to express those thoughts. And, and then I thought, Teresa did that on purpose. She was making theater. She was asking us all to do that so that we could have that conflict in the room and have our, have our multifaceted feelings about this. And that is why I'm a theater artist, because I like to take something that ho is homogenous, something that is one country under God, and break it into lots of different pieces and say, no, it's heterogenetic. Um, and look how it is, and to discover myself through that, and hopefully um, allow the audience to discover that. So it was a really beautiful, beautiful piece of theater yesterday. 
And I just wanted to acknowledge that. And, and that's all. I want to say thank you very much. I, I will try to continue to be an innovator in an art form that is about innovation. <laughs> Thanks a lot. All right, just a few things. Um, thank you, Taylor. Thank you, Loretta. Uh, at 5 p.m., so just in a few minutes, in Sapphire 410 on this floor, uh, Blue Star Theaters will be hosting Bass Track, a multimedia performance produced by Anne Hamburger, or godmother of site-specific theater, inspired by the words, the words of Marines serving in Afghanistan and their families, along with a town hall discussion engaging with military families that are actually coming to this piece. Uh, Bass Track will actually premiere in the fall at BAM. So check that out in room 410. Uh, the Theaters of Color meeting is happening in Sapphire 400, also on this floor. And some of our dine arounds are getting started that early. So if you haven't already signed up for one, please head to the host committee table in the exhibit hall. And after your dine around, or whatever shows you see tonight, don't forget that at 10 o'clock, the San Diego Host Committee is having a late night party at the San Diego Rep with food, local beer, and lots of fun entertainment. But please, don't go too crazy. Um, we've got a bright and early start again tomorrow uh, with some great programming as early as 8 a.m. Some of the role-based affinity